In 1997, Apple released their most famous commercial of all time. This commercial would not only save Apple from going out of business, but would also pave the way for amazing innovations like the iPhone, MacBook, AirPods, and many, many more. It sprung Apple into popularity and made them a $2 trillion company. So how did they do it? Who made this commercial? And how did it motivate billions of people to buy Apple products? To answer that, we need to travel back to 1997 a time when Apple was struggling and on a downward spiral toward bankruptcy. In 1997, Apple was in a very dark place in its history. With competitors like IBM and Microsoft dominating the market, there were widespread predictions that Apple would disappear forever. Apple's share of the computer market had plummeted from a peak of 14% in 1993 to below 3% in 1997. As a matter of fact, they were doing so bad that in early 1997, they only had 90 days of money left to stay in business. The company was floundering due to poor product launches, a horrible operating system, and a lack of focus overall. That lack of focus might have been a result of Steve Jobs being fired from the company a decade previously in 1985. That year, Jobs was forced out of his own company after a long power struggle with the company's board and its then CEO, John Scully. Thirsty for revenge, Jobs took a few Apple employees with him to create Next, a computer platform development company that specialized in computers for higher education and business use. Steve would eventually get his revenge because in mid-1997, Apple ironically bought out Steve's company because he had created a revolutionary operating system called Next Step, which would later serve as the foundation for Mac OS. Apple welcomed him back as the CEO, and now that Jobs was back, it was time for him to plan a revival for Apple. He instantly noticed one problem that was destroying Apple's brand and reputation. Their advertising strategy was horrible. Apple was running more than 25 different advertising campaigns all around the world, and all of them were misaligned with the brand's core beliefs. Also during this period, BBDO, Apple's advertising agency, had opted to focus its advertisements on specific Apple products and the technological features of Apple computers. These efforts did nothing to ease consumers' fears that Apple was eventually going to go out of business. People didn't want to buy a computer that they thought wouldn't be around the next year. Steve knew that Apple needed a a brand new single advertising campaign to woo consumers back to the brand. He wanted to find a new advertising agency to do so. So he dropped BBDO and searched for a new one. And this search would eventually lead to the advertising agency that would create Apple's most influential campaign of all time. During this same time period, an ad agency called TBWA was going about business as usual. They were a huge ad agency that worked with big companies like Nissan and Infinity. One day at work, Lee Cloud, the chairman and global director for the agency, got a call from Steve regarding a meeting he wanted to have with them. Excited as can be, Lee, along with Rob Siltanen, the chief creative officer at TBWA flew out to California to attend the meeting. At the meeting, Steve said that, We have some decent product, but we need to get things figured out. I'm putting the advertising up for review, and I'm meeting with a handful of agencies to see who gets it. I've already been talking with a couple of agencies that seem pretty good, and you're invited to pitch the account if you're interested. This made Lee and Rob very upset, as they had no plans to pitch anything against other agencies and expected to get their account right away. They thought they would get it because Apple and TBWA had worked in the past, most notably on Apple's legendary 1984 commercial. Regardless, Lee still wanted to pitch them because he thought it would make a great story. So, Lee and Rob returned to New York and requested that people started creating ideas immediately. One of those people was Craig Tanimoto, a TBWA art director. He started to draw some sketches of legendary people in history like Thomas Edison and Albert Einstein and combined them with Apple's logo and the words, think different. A week later, Craig pitched his idea to Rob and Lee at a meeting and both were confused but intrigued. Rob asked Craig what it all meant and he said, IBM has a campaign out that says, think IBM a campaign for their ThinkPad computer, and I feel Apple is very different from IBM, so I felt Think Different was interesting. I then thought it would be cool to attach those words to some of the world's most different thinking people in the world. Rob and Lee loved the idea and tasked everyone in the room to start making a commercial about the idea and to blow it out on other media. The commercial they ended up making was over two minutes long, which was over the standard length of one minute, but it perfectly portrayed the vibe TBWA was going for. The commercial featured different thinking legends, like like MLK, John Lennon, Amelia Earhart, Muhammad Ali, and many more. The message of the commercial communicated what Apple stood for by celebrating and linking Apple to those innovators who moved the world ahead. The inference was that Apple users also think different, ask different questions, and potentially change the world. With the idea set in stone, Lee and Rob flew out to California to pitch the idea to Steve. Lee was the one who gave the entire pitch, 
and he nailed it. After the pitch, Jobs looked around the room filled with think different billboards and said, this is great, this is really great, but I can't do this. People already think I'm an egotist and putting the Apple logo up there with all these geniuses will get me skewered by the press. Steve then paused, looked around the room and said, what am I doing? Screw it, it's the right thing, it's great. Let's talk tomorrow. Steve didn't know it, but by bringing back TBWA, he would not only change the course of Apple, but the world as we know it. Lee and Rob were excited and more motivated than ever to finish and release the campaign. But there was a problem. The problem was that their commercial was too long and needed to be cut down from two minutes to one minute. So Rob rewrote the script of the commercial and cut down the dialogue to 60 seconds. He based the new script on quotes from Robin Williams in Dead Poet Society and he loved it. Lee loved it as well. So the two shared it with a bunch of people around the office and several of them said it gave them goosebumps. With high hopes, Rob re-recorded a rough cut of the script and the duo once again flew to California to share it with Steve. They played the audio for him once and when it finished, Jobs said, it sucks, I hate it. I thought you were going to write something like Dead Poet Society. This is crap. Rob was taken back by his outburst. He had poured his heart and soul into the piece, but Steve was still going off on him. Jobs continued to say he thought it was crap, and Lee, trying to put out the fire, said they would go back and try some other things. After returning to New York, Rob stopped working on the campaign to keep up with his clients at Nissan and Infinity. Meanwhile, Lee gave the Apple script assignment to various copywriters within the agency and told them to make it better. One of the writers given this assignment was Ken Segal. Ken was a gifted writer who was hired shortly after TBWA got Apple's business. One day, Ken came into Rob's office and said, Jobs has seen a ton of scripts and he's gone full circle. We're moving ahead with your script. I made some tweaks. I hope you don't mind. Ken had added some beautiful additions to the script. His additional touches were terrific, and he truly did make the spot better than ever, but the heart and soul of the script from the original version stayed fully intact. The script was voiced over by Richard Dreyfus, and the commercial was finalized and ready to release. So, on the 8th of August in 1997, at Macworld Expo, Steve Jobs introduced the world to Apple's new slogan think different. His presentation planted the seeds for the ad so it would seem more organic when Apple debuted the new commercial. And they did so when they aired the official Think Different commercial on September 28, 1997, right after the premiere of the animated film Toy Story. Soon after the release, the tagline Think Different accompanied Apple advertisements all over the place. Apple put up ads throughout the public on billboards, magazines, newspapers, and buses. All the ads were the same a black and white image of an innovative leader in history with Think Different printed in the corner. Suddenly, people began to realize that Apple wasn't just any old computer. It was so powerful and simple to use that it made the average computer user feel innovative and tech savvy. However, some of the talk about Think Different wasn't good. A writer for the Los Angeles Times ripped on the campaign, saying, It's perfect that Apple is doing a campaign with a bunch of dead guys, because the brand will be dead soon too. But the great thing was, good or bad, people were talking about a brand that had fallen off their radar and they were talking a lot. Apple clearly had a pulse, and while they weren't as strong as a lion, they certainly gave the impression they were. Apple was off to the races and about to make history, and they did exactly that. A year after the commercial launched, Apple's stock price had tripled, and by 2000, Apple was worth $5 billion, over double what they were worth in 1997. But the impact of Think Different was much bigger than the numbers. The tagline of the campaign expressed how, under Steve Jobs' leadership, Apple would construct a radically different future from its troubled days in the early 1990s. Apple's core beliefs of thinking different led to products like the iPod, iTunes, the App Store, the iPhone, the iPad, AirPods, the Apple Watch, and many more to come. Instead of contending for existing demand, these devices all took a similar strategic approach. They reconstructed existing market boundaries and created new demand, all as a result of thinking different. It's a strong argument to say that the reconstruction of Apple's core beliefs in 1997 to think different has led them to become a $2 trillion company. It's what made Apple into the cult-like company we know today and has transformed the technology world as we know it.